Hello and welcome to The Renegade Economist. Tonight we discuss the American dream, which, whether people have chosen it or not, has become a global aspiration. Some think of it as the only way to progress, whilst others think of it as a wrapper for an outdated economic system. To unpick this and provide their own insight, it's a pleasure to welcome tonight's guest to Renegade Economist HQ. Larry Lamb, British actor, broadcaster and someone who is increasingly disenchanted with the way the world is being run. George Lamb, who's son of Larry, also a broadcaster and founder of Radio Wolfgang, and who, after years of wild television success, had an epiphany. Roger Maverty is the former chief executive of the Conran Group and now author, photographer, and appropriately for us, he's penned the book, Rule Breakers Book of Business. Larry, let me start with you. When I say the American dream, what, what image is conjured or what, what, what does it say to you? What does it describe? I lived it. I'm a product of it. You know, I'm a boy from the sort of outer edges of London and I needed to get a life and I found out there was a job in Germany selling encyclopedias to American servicemen that were stationed there in 1968. Um, that was the beginning of it. I was trained to be an American salesman. I then got into the oil business and worked in, in the UK, in Libya, in America and then finished up in Canada. But key to the whole thing was this essence of anybody can do anything. Anybody has the right to go for it and make the best of whatever life has to offer for them. Opportunity, fundamentally opportunity. Fundamentally, it was about opportunity. For me, it's unstoppable enthusiasm. It's a country completely without self-doubt, which I think is its great strength, and probably also its great weakness. And speaking as an English person, we do self-doubt better than anybody. But the Americans don't yet. Vietnam tried to give them self-doubt. 9-11 tried to give them self-doubt. But they've resisted it manfully. And it is a country driven by enthusiasm and self-belief. George? I think probably the same as Dad. And, and having watched the, the possibilities and the opportunities that were afforded to people if they really worked hard and got their head down and got a few lucky breaks and all the rest of it and, and seen uh, how far my dad's been able to take his life, you know, and when I look at that now, and, 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 and I don't think that kind of upward mobility or an upward mobility is not, maybe it's kind of an, it's an ugly construct, but you know, it, I don't see that that's available to people anymore. I think Dad's generation were probably the last generation of people who, who you know, seemingly you were able to, you know, to, to pull yourself up and, and get on. And, and now the power and the money and, and all of it is just so centralized and, and so um, concentrated they're not letting anybody else, you know, enjoy the American dream. I'm not sure that I'm convinced that America is this land of unstoppably equal opportunity. The American dream is alive and well, just not in America. A study called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor has demonstrated that Americans are about as likely to start their own business as people who live in Iran. Whereas, in frontier markets, we see much higher rates of entrepreneurship. And we're talking about places like Namibia, Uganda, Bolivia, Colombia, all kinds of places that are far away from the US. In fact, you might say that going west, as was the old flavor of the American dream, now means going west across the Atlantic to get to America. Because the Kaufman Index, which is a study that matches up census data and economic indicators as well as surveys, shows that people go to America, immigrants go there to start businesses. In fact, they're twice as likely to start a new business in the States as a natural born US citizen. One of the things that the American dream is built on, Thatcher in the UK uh, picked this up and sold it very hard, was a property owning democracy. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you, if you strip that language down, what is a property owning democracy? It's somebody who owns a bit of land, uh, and how you own land is a different philosophical uh, debate, but it's somebody who owns a bit of land, or takes a bit of land, and then builds their life on it. Uh, it could, and let's talk about this, land speculation in the property market in this country and the US has been a catastrophic disaster. What's your view on that, Roger? Let's start with you. Well, I think if you're very ambitious, and nobody is more ambitious as a nation than America, you get greedy. And I think the collapse of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the subprime mortgages and so forth was simply the manifestation of people being more greedy than the market would allow. And if you lend money to people that can't afford to pay it back, it's going to backfire. I think it's more to do with the emotion of undiluted ambition than it is to do with how land is organised. So it's about human emotions, yeah. it's not about the economic mechanism that, that allows uplift in land price? No, I think Americans just like more. 
I find it tough that, that greed has driven the land market and collapsed the banking system. Do you have a view on this? And specifically from the Thatcher point of view, who has borrowed the idea from Reagan and Reaganomics to say that actually we should speculate in land. Because what we've got now, Larry, um, generation rent is alive and well and, 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 and around us. It's, it certainly is, and, then, and, and generation rent are really the ones that are taking the full force of what's, you know, what's been cooked up. Getting back to the American dream, it seems to me what drives the American dream is a belief that if you marry enthusiasm and ambition with hard work, things are gradually going to get better and better for you incrementally. And that's true as long as the economic background behind you is also in a period of gradual growth. But if you hit the buffers and things suddenly start to go wrong, as they did with Lehman's a few years ago, then that ethic of hard work and ambition just unravels. So is the American dream about hard work and rewards, productivity and growth? Well, actually, no. We're seeing that productivity generally is dropping across all the Western economies. And what we're also seeing is that even though about 77% of US businesses offer flexible working and more amenable conditions, about 63% of people, according to a, a survey of 1.4 million employees across the Western world, say being at work is like being a zombie. You worked throughout your 20s and 30s very, very hard. Yep. You were wildly successful in the UK, uh, materially abundant, I'd argue. Yep. And then one day, and I want you to take us through the story, you called your dad because you had that house. <coughs> yep. Pick it up from there. I left school, worked in the music business, did all right at that for a bit. Then I kind of ended up by chance becoming a television presenter. And, uh, and, then, and then it all started to go very well. And I kind of rode the, I rode the back end of the reality TV bubble. 3.5 million games have been played online. Five dramatic contests have taken place in this real bank, and it all comes down to this. Hundreds of thousands of pounds will be won tonight. This is the Bank Job Grand Final. Uh, and then I found myself uh, standing in a fake bank built inside a real bank asking poor people questions about reality TV stars and if they got it right there was a chance they, where they could pick a box and then maybe there'd be some money in the box but if they got through to the final we'd kind of found a way to pull out the worst bits of human nature and the chances are they double cross each other and then they wouldn't get it and and I just in the middle of one show I just thought I was I stood there and I just thought what am I doing like who am I what is this this is just nonsense the riots had just happened three months before that was the first the time London riots. the London riots and that was the first time something big socially had happened in, in my backyard and something that I could empathize with and I understood those kids and I saw them and I saw them I saw them so frustrated and not really having any clear direction about what they were frustrated about. And, and when you have that kind of level of anger and there is no, there's no focus for it, then you've really got to worry because that just shows you that people are really wound up and, they're, and, they're, and they've had enough, basically. And I realised that actually, having gone through that period where Dad and I were both on telly simultaneously and it was all, we were both doing really well, that... If, we, if I walked into a room full of rich people, nobody knew who I was. And if I walked into a room full, full of poor people, not only did they know who I was, they knew my dad, they knew everything I'd ever done, they knew all about us. And I just realised that telly basically was a distraction for poor people. On the whole, I know that's quite a kind of sweeping statement, but generally speaking, it's distraction for poor people. And, and, uh, and I realised that I, I couldn't be complicit in selling them a kind of nonsense and selling them a kind of unachievable or, or distracting them, really. I want to go to that moment, though, because it's really interesting. And yeah. this is very much the other end of, of you know, people trying to get on the housing ladder. You were on it. You were yeah. lying in your bed, North London. You phoned your I dad. Rang my I rang my dad the next morning. What do you after, say? And I just said, uh, I said, Dad, like, I've got all this stuff, and I've got a really nice house, and I've got a nice car. How much car. stuff did you have? I d I d enough stuff. I didn't, have, you know, I didn't have a boat and a did, plane and did all you, the rest like, of it. Did you put your stuff like, in a stuff sto a self storage I, stuff place? Do you know what? I kind of got rid of quite a lot of it, And then, go, of it, and then go and visit your stuff yes. at weekends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. I did a little bit of that actually um, but I, I I woke up and I just said look you know I'm, I'm everybody's telling me I'm killing it 
I've got all the material kind of uh, belongings that, that I thought I really wanted. I'm finally on primetime television. I don't feel very happy. And Dad just said to me, well, you know. And I was like, well, you know what? And he said, well, you know, game show host, not a very serious guy in the big scheme of things, is he? And I, I was just like, not really. And so eight weeks later, I'd sold my house. I'd got rid of most of my stuff. And I went off to find myself. In Asia, in naturally. Way, <laughs> of course you do. In a way, what you've described is a crisis of self-doubt. And it gets back to my point that what drives the American dream is a complete lack of self-doubt. They just absolutely believe in yeah. what they're trying to do. And as yeah. soon as you start questioning that, yeah. you know, the fuel drains away. Yeah. It might have drained away, in your point, circumstance, for a very good reason, with a, in terms of your personal happiness, a very good result. But to an American, that might seem a rather overly Buddhist position. The American dream is really an ambition for more. And actually, you can't have a world where everybody has more. There's not enough more to go around. No, no but, but you can not... have a world where everybody's got a much fairer share. That's the point. Like, and when I, I can remember the first time I ever came in touch with the third world, and I was involved in making a film, and we were in Mexico, mm -hmm. and we were in a glorious villa on the edge of the ocean, on the edge of the Pacific, just outside... Um, Acapulco but when you walked out the door of the glorious villa there were people living in total squalor across the street with well, pigs running it, it around. It depends what you mean by that. The first time I went to India I spent, I travelled around, it was a business trip and I was there for about three weeks and the last day I had a guide from the government because I was doing a job for the Indian government and she spent the day with me and she asked me what I'd enjoyed about India and I said I was particularly interested in their fascination with religions. And she asked me about my religion, and, and I said, I don't really have one, you know, I'd like to, but I have no faith. And she, if I said, oh, nice to meet you, I've got terminal cancer, she wouldn't have been more shocked. Yeah. She was absolutely stunned. And in the 24 hours I was with her, she kept asking me this. And when I, she took me to the airport for the flight back, and her final words to me were not have a good flight, as you would have said, at Heathrow or Gatwick. She said, my family will pray for you always. And to her... The fact that I didn't have faith, that was poverty. Yep. Yeah, I had a nice car at home and a good flat, but yep. she didn't really care about that. As long as her family aren't going to die of starvation, that's enough. Yep. She had spiritual richness, which I lacked. So I think in terms of how we deal with what we've got and what we haven't got, a big part of it is actually defining what within that is important. But we're all sitting around here and we've talked about India and South America and Mexico and different places in the world. And all of us uh, um, mentally have gone to the place that, that um, we've just thought, well, actually, the American dream should be transposed onto these different nations because then poverty will lift and well, all the, the rest American of it. Dream, are are we unconsciously making that? Original form. And to say more about that, the American dream in its well, original form. When it was a chance for everybody to get on. You know, everybody did have the chance. There were, as you, as you pointed out. I mean, you know, I can remember going visiting fam people that I married into a family, you know, absolutely dirt poor people living in the Appalachian, the backwoods, you know, where they literally do go shooting squirrels to eat. Right. And, and so it was there. It very definitely was there because that system demands that there are going to be people who have basically got their living on a subsistence on level. The margin. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But... The chance was, and the hope was, that the, you know, the dream could be theirs. So if no political party can deliver that kind of prosperity, is it not the case? Can we not all agree that there is an economic mechanism at play at the world in the moment that is, that is entrenching this poverty in the system? Absolutely. We have to agree on that. Right. Right. We have to agree on that. Is, Sorry, is, is, do you not? Is, no, I do, but I wonder whether the key word is dream. Actually, the point of the American dream is it's something for people to aim at. It yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that... That they can't get there. That, that they're going to get there. And actually, to a sensible degree, people do need a dream. They need a hope and they need an ambition. The problem is that it can't be too different from what's realisable. Right. But if the dream that we've been sold is to own your home and get on the ladder, but you are being made, and, you're, and there is no doubt about it, when you start talking about generation rent, mm -hmm. who people are know they have got no chance, to, and these are ordinary middle class kids, where they've got no chance of moving out, they are stuck. Then, sure. then the dream that you've given them is absolutely denied them. And that's what I find absolutely offensive. I suppose, you know, without focusing too much on, on this, you know, just keep on 
speaking on this American Dream thing, just you know, a culture where the first major play that you make, and, and I appreciate I've done the same thing as you, I've, I've leveraged houses and mm. been able to start business and all the rest of it, but if the first major play you make is about getting something that, that essentially kind of is a, is a, is a massive uh, you know, ball and chain round, round your ankles and then you're unable to have the quality of life that you really want. We all know loads of people who are effectively just working their whole life just to pay off a house. And surely the whole essence of life is not just about is, is not just about rampant acquisition and Cons consumption consumerism. and just buying stuff and the whole focus, kind of everybody's focus when they come out of school is about I need to get on and make some money and I need to get on and get a house and I get, need to get on and be success because all that the, the, the world seems to admire is, is monetary success and we, our whole kind of uh, value system is based on materialism. Very rarely do you walk in somewhere and somebody says, hey, that guy over there, he's an incredibly empathetic, compassionate, wonderful, kind human being. You should see all the stuff he's doing. They're like, that guy's super rich. He's got 50 mil, you know, like, wow. And then everybody's like, oh, hi, yeah, nice to meet you. And they're all excited to, you know, chat to him and maybe get some, maybe he'll just give them, you know, a pearl sure. of his wisdom. Half the time, they're arseholes. No, no. Um, um, so, but Donald Trump is held up as the kind of <laughs> um, is the, is held up as the uh, as the kind of poster boy for this dream. True, or, true or not, right? Yeah. But but if you if you not by me, yeah. Uh, well, but but by a lot, he's Do Donald Trump. You know, this yeah. is how to do business. Uh, um, but look, you know, but look, look, what's happened from Donald Trump? You know, he starts the thing, he gets involved with the thing called the Apprentice, and then what we have is this sort of this this Roman bread and circuses trip where we get a, a senior executive is extremely wealthy being aggressively nasty to people as entertainment does that legitimize that kind of bullying in the no, workplace no it doesn't no at but all. by people seeing it on television it does, do they think they can go out and buy a and, suit and, and then behave what, and like that that is what is going on i feel that to is, talk about that that's Aaron. all part and parcel of the <coughs> acceptance of this new order which is a corruption of the American dream. Let's look at the British version of The Apprentice uh, uh, here in the UK, a guy called Alan Sugar, Sir Alan Sugar, yeah. Lord Alan Sugar. In fact, he's got so many prefixes now, you don't quite know how to refer to the man. Uh, he started... Well, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, he started, Roger, i come to you, he started making things. Telephones, computers... Sure. All he ended his career uh, on The Apprentice, shouting at people, you're fired, and all that stuff. Right? Yeah. And in between, he invested in property and the whole thing went bang. Is there not a cultural uh, um, icon there in the sense that this is where you start making stuff and doing stuff, American dream, then you get sucked into property, then you end up on the telly shouting at well, people? I, I, yes, I think there is because we live in kind of celebrity culture land and clearly Alan Sugar has decided that <coughs> what will satisfy his quite significant ego is to be a famous person. The fact that he's famous for turning bullying into a kind of art form doesn't seem to me a particularly worthwhile ambition, but he doesn't seem to mind. I mean, I think The Apprentice is, I know it's popular. To me, it's a profoundly silly program on two levels. As somebody who spent most of their life in business, it's got absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with how business operates. It really doesn't. And secondly, I shouldn't say this, but it's true, so I will. Bullying is part of how you manage people. But if you're a good manager, bullying is a very small part. Exactly. And it's something which you kind of is a bit of a last resort. Exactly. And on the whole, you need to manage people with a lot more hope and a lot less fear. And I think that program is a celebration of bullying. And in that sense, I just find it, and it's rather an old fashioned term, I find it discourteous. I just like people to be nicer to each other than that. And if people want to watch a kind of retired businessman shouting at people, <laughs> fine, I'm not going to stop them. I just don't want to do it myself. In 214, where we are more empathetic, you've edged at that, uh, do public figures have a duty of care to their audience? Or is that too worthy? Is that like saying to the Americans, go and live in Denmark? 100% they do. Yeah, absolutely. But if you say to the, Ameri the, the, the capitalist American, go and live in Denmark, oh no, it's socialist. If you say to your uber celebrity now, you've got a duty of care to your audience, can you imagine yeah. what the agent would but say? We've all, but the, the, you know, yeah, we've all got a care of duty to one another. We're all, part, we're all in this together. 
I've got a care of duty to you, you've got a care of duty to me. And like, that's the problem. There's this sort of every everybody's yeah. you know, it, everybody's it's... duty to, to to everybody's duty to be part of, of a community is so, it's it's somehow other been it's been slid off. But so there's this it, sense it, of you don't have to be. Isn't it something that we're all part of? I mean, when we talk about the banking crisis, we tend to talk about it as if those bankers are villains. And I'm not saying they weren't very foolish and greedy, because clearly they were. But they didn't lend money to nobody, they lent it to people. Yeah, we can't. And the people who borrowed the money, which they knew they couldn't pay back, just like the bankers knew they couldn't pay it back, yeah. are implicated <coughs> in this. And actually, if people want to watch ridiculous brainless programs on television, and to worship people simply because they're recognised rather than because they've got some worth or some gift, then you've got to blame the audience a bit as well as the performers. I think the duty of care thing is absolutely reciprocal. But if they want to worship them, fine. But if they feel that the only way to have any real worth is to emulate them so that being one of them, being one of those famous people becomes this aim, then, for me, you've, th then, then it's doing damage. As we wrap up, and we have to, and I don't want to because I could go on all night with this, uh, w solutions, because we can't just come here and talk about all that is wrong. And, and, and there have been solutions so far. But, but what we need to also think about is how, where from here. I think there's a, a grassroots economic renaissance that's happening to the American dream. We're seeing that there's the growth of this new thing, the sharing economy, uh, a world where people value access over ownership, which is really valuing time over the acquisition of wealth. And this is huge. In the US economy, it's reckoned to be worth around $110 billion dollars and that's peer-to-peer -peer lending it's things like airbnb where people rent out their spare rooms it's things like uber and ride relay where people share cars and have different kinds of model where they rent rather than buy because it's clear nobody in the world you go outside no one in the world say yeah it's all working it's all working perfectly far from it so what would be a solution i'm going to venture one because and it's thematic it's what's come out of um, what i kind of heard um, this evening and if you're going to talk about the American Dream 2.0, if you're going to upgrade it, if we upgrade our computers and our software and all the rest of it, we haven't upgraded our economics for an awfully long time. Some would say too long. I'd say too long. Is it not about that there's a spiritual happiness element uh, here and, and there's a consumer culture, and, and but both are really mutually exclusive? And can we talk about that a little and then come to some conclusions and solutions on where best from here? Larry, let's start with you. Well, I mean, to me, the, the, the glaring problem, if you start, in, you know, in Britain, you, you work out from this extraordinary creation that's, you know, 21st century London, is this extraordinary dearth of, of property for people to live in. You know, we've got a big problem here and nobody seems, you know, now for more than a generation, nobody seems to have addressed it. They've worked against it. And so what, what we really need to start things here is an evening out of the playing field in terms of living space for people. You've got the haves and you've very definitely got the have-nots and they're just getting, the gap is getting wider and wider. And so, you, you know, we need strong leadership that is prepared to, to move essentially left of centre and be brave. And so, no, we have got to address this problem we have got to get it so that people have got a chance to have somewhere to live where they are not going to spend everything they've got on, 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 on just paying their rent. On a basic human necessity. So that, exactly, on a basic human necessity. George, what's your view? It's about taking responsibility. Is, is that, that might, that's the main solution for me. It's about taking responsibility and realising that if you want to make a change, then you're going to have to be that change. And... Um, and just waiting around for someone to throw you a bone or someone to sort it all out for you or everything, you know, someone's going to make it better or this different part is going to get in and then it will be all right. It doesn't work like that. You know, you have to actively make a decision in your life that you don't want it to continue the way it's continuing. You know, so my first big decision in life was I was on this trajectory going on the fame train and doing that whole thing. And 
you know, whoop de doo and I decided, you know what, I don't want to do that, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't like a, you know, it's not like a getting shelled in Gaza problem, but, you know, it plays with your head a little bit and you, you, you start questioning yourself because everything you've really been going after this whole life, everything you've really valued, you, you start to say, actually, I don't want that. And then you start to question who you are and what you're all about. And so that's the first bit for me. I took that step of, of saying, right, that's not who I want to be. That's not how I want to run my life. It's not going to be as easy financially moving forward, but you know, whatever, we're going to figure it out. And my quality of life in the last couple of years has been, you know, like tenfold. And the stuff that I've learned and the, the space and time that I've had, you know, because by the way, whilst I was doing that whole fame game, on a, on a nice cushy one and getting picked up in cars and all the rest of it, but I was like running myself into the ground. I was doing, you know, I was doing at one point, I was doing 13 live shows a week, you know, and so you, you're just smashing yourself to bits in order to do that. So I was doing my version of what the guy who's going in and doing the 80 hour week is and, you know, and not seeing my kids and not having that time to grow up and enjoy with the family and just, you know, take responsibility, realize what you want, realize that actually, Love and family and friends and happiness is far more important than an extra litre on your car or, you know, an extra bedroom or whatever it is, or a nicer suit, you know, and, and actually, and, and find that balance, you know, and also, uh, just very quickly, sorry, but also, like, remember that um, you're, you're, you're part of the ecosystem. It's not just a resource for you. And so that's also a massive change that we need to start. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mindset thing and it's a, a mind shift. And you just have to realize that actually, if you don't start looking after that, then you're not gonna have to worry about anything anyway, because we'll all be underwater and it'll all be the end. So. And on that cheery note. <laughs> but, but broadly, Roger, have you got a pithy uh, a bit of wisdom that we can wrap on? Almost certainly not, but uh, <laughs> I think the thing about the American dream is that dreams are simple and the American dream is really about anybody can be wealthy. And actually, since Lehman's, we've understood that the world is a much more complicated place than that. Everything is much more interconnected and there isn't enough prosperity around for everybody to be wealthy. What we need to be thinking about is still paying the bills and still feeding ourselves and getting rid of poverty as best we can, but actually understanding the pleasure of living in a much broader way, which is to do with physical health and emotional health and family and stuff, as well as just money. But what will get people to understand that pleasure is defined as something more than simply having a bigger, faster car next year is a huge question. Um, and I don't know where it's going to come from. Clearly, George has had a kind of epiphany, but in a way, most people didn't have his good fortune of being in such a prominent place in the first place. In order to escape from that trap, exactly. you had to get in it. Yep. <laughs> I'm in the happy position that I can write books and take photographs, which is actually much more satisfying than shouting at people in the office to drive the sales and profits up. But actually, one of the main reasons I can do it is because for the last 5,000 years, I've been shouting at people in the office and I've accumulated a bit of dough. So we're all kind of trapped by the money thing and somehow we have to get out of it. But if you want to know how, you're going to have to find a wiser panelist than me because I don't know. We have uh, raped over enough of this to uh, elicit some solutions and hopefully we've uh, elicited some solutions in the hearts and minds of uh, the good people watching us. Guys, uh, thank you all very much for coming in. It's, I've loved it and uh, it's, been, uh, it's been excellent to have you. Thank you all. That's it for the Renegade Economist this week. Uh, we all know you know how to use the internet, so forage about, find us, send us a note because uh, we do want to hear your thoughts. But until next time, stay curious. been learning how to speak French. Wind back the tape and go through them as often as you like until you feel you know them. Ready? Janvier. Janvier. Février. Février. Mars. Mars. Avril. Avril. Mai. Mai. Juin. Juin. Juillet. Juillet. Août. Août. Septembre. Septembre. Octobre. Octobre. Novembre. Novembre. 
décembre. Décembre. Wind back the tape and go through them as often as you like until you feel you know them. Ready? Janvier. I met a girl in January. Février. I asked her out in February. Mars. By March we were married. Avril. In April we moved to Paris. Mai. In May she told me she'd met someone else. Juin. In June I'd found out who was that someone else. Juillet. July I have no recollection of. Août. I found work in a bar in August. Septembre. September I was still in the bar. October. October still in the bar. November. November, I was employee of the month. December. I went to the Christmas party in December. I enjoyed working in the bar. They let me get up on stage and play my guitar. When it got busy, I had to stop and serve some drinks, but I would always get a nice round of applause. Wind back the tape and go through them as often as you like until but you my mind you know went back Ready? to... Janvier. When I met a girl in January. Février. And I asked her out in February. Mars. By March we were married. Avril. In April we moved to Paris. May. In May she told me she'd met someone else. Juin. In June I'd found out who was that someone else. Juillet. In July I have no recollection of. Oot. Thank heavens I found that bar job in August. Septembre. September I was still in the bar. October. October still in the bar. November. November I was made assistant manager. December. I helped organize the Christmas party in December. She told me she'd met someone else In June I'd found out who was that someone else In July I have no recollection of Oh God, I'm still in this bar in August September, I'm still in the bar October, still in the bar November, I was made manager I organized the Christmas party in December Wind back the tape and go through them as often as you like until you feel you know them. Ready? Janvier. So I'm in the bar in January. Février. I'm in the bar in February. Mars. In March we had a mouse issue. Avril. In April we got a new brand of tissue. In Mais. May Peroni was our biggest seller. Juin. In June, I reorganized the beer cellar. Juillet. July, I have no recollection of. Oof. I fired a member of staff for swearing in August. Septembre. September, we got a new flavor of crisp. October. October, I sent back that flavor of crisp. November. November, takings are down. Is there a thief? December. No, there wasn't. I just counted wrong. Because I thought about I thought about Janvier Oh 3.5 million games have been played online. Five dramatic contests have taken place in this real bank, and it all comes down to this. Hundreds of thousands of pounds will be won tonight. This is the Bank Job Grand Final. 
uh, and then I found myself uh, standing in a fake bank built inside a real bank asking <laughs> poor people questions about reality TV stars and if they got it right there was a chance they, where they could pick a box and then maybe there'd be some money in the box but if they got through to the final we would kind of found a way to pull out the worst bits of human nature and the chances are they double cross each other and then they wouldn't get it and and I just in the middle of one show I just thought I was I stood there and I just thought what am I doing like who am I what is this this is just nonsense the riots had just happened three months before that was the first the time London riots. the London riots and that was the first time something big socially had happened in, in my backyard and something that I could empathize with and I understood those kids and I saw them and I saw them I saw them so frustrated and not really having any clear direction about what they were frustrated about and, and when you have that kind of level of anger and there is no there's no focus for it then you've really got to worry because that just shows you that people are really wound up and they're, and they're and they've had enough basically and I realized that actually having gone through that period where dad and I were both on telly simultaneously and it was all we were both doing really well that if, we, if I walked into a room full of rich people, nobody knew who I was. And if I walked into a room full, full of poor people, not only did they know who I was, they knew my dad, they knew everything I'd ever done, they knew all about us. And I just realised that telly basically was a distraction for poor people. On the whole, I know that's quite a kind of sweeping statement, but generally speaking, it's distraction for poor people. And, and, uh, and I realised that I, I couldn't be complicit in selling them a kind of nonsense and selling them a kind of unachievable or, or distracting them, really. I want to go to that moment though because it's really interesting and yeah. this is very much the other end of, of you know people trying to get on the housing ladder you were on it you're yeah. lying in your bed north london you phoned your I dad rang my t i rang my dad the next morning what do you after, say? and i just said uh, i said dad like i've got all this stuff and i've got a really nice house and i've got a nice how car. much stuff did you have? I d I d enough stuff i didn't have they really worked hard and got their head down and got a few lucky breaks and all the rest of it and and seen uh, how far my dad's been able to take his life you know and when I look at that now, and, 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 and I don't think that kind of upward mobility or uh, an upward mobility is not, maybe it's kind of an, it's an ugly construct, but you know, it, I don't see that that's available to people anymore. I think dad's generation were probably the last generation of people who, who you know, seemingly you were able to, you know, to, to pull yourself up and, and get on. And, and now the power and the money and, and all of it is just so centralized and, and so um, concentrated they're not letting anybody else, you know, enjoy the American drink. I'm not sure that I'm convinced that America is this land of unstoppably equal opportunity. The American dream is alive and well, just not in America. A study called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor has demonstrated that Americans are about as likely to start their own business as people who live in Iran. Whereas, in frontier markets, we see much higher rates of entrepreneurship. And we're talking about places like Namibia, Uganda, Bolivia, Colombia, all kinds of places that are far away from the US. In fact, you might say that going west, as was the old flavour of the American dream, now means going west across the Atlantic to get to America. Because the Kaufman Index, which is a study that matches up census data and economic indicators as well as surveys, shows that people go to America, immigrants go there to start businesses. In fact, they're twice as likely to start a new business in the States as a natural-born US citizen. One of the things that the American dream is built on, Thatcher in the UK uh, picked this up and sold it very hard, was a property-owning democracy. Mm. And actually, if you, if you strip that language down, what is a property-owning democracy? It's somebody who owns a bit of land, uh, and how you own land is a different philosophical uh, debate, but it's somebody who owns a bit of land, or takes a bit of land, and then builds their life on it. Uh, it could, and let's talk about this. Land speculation in the property market in this country and the US has been a catastrophic disaster. What's your view on that, Roger? Let's start with you. Well, I think if you're very ambitious, and nobody is more ambitious as a nation than America, you get greedy. And I think the collapse of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the subprime mortgages and so forth was simply the manifestation of people being. And welcome to The Renegade Economist. Tonight we discuss the American dream, which, whether people have chosen it or not, 
has become a global aspiration. Some think of it as the only way to progress, whilst others think of it as a wrapper for an outdated economic system. To unpick this and provide their own insight, it's a pleasure to welcome tonight's guest to Renegade Economist HQ. Larry Lamb, British actor, broadcaster and someone who is increasingly disenchanted with the way the world is being run. George Lamb, who's son of Larry, also a broadcaster and founder of Radio Wolfgang, and who, after years of wild television success, had an epiphany. Roger Mavity is the former chief executive of the Conran Group and now author, photographer, and appropriately for us, he's penned the book, Rule Breaker's Book of Business. Larry, let me start with you. When I say the American dream, what, what image is conjured or what, what, what does it say to you? What does it describe? I lived it. I'm a product of it. You know, I'm a boy from the sort of outer edges of London and I needed to get a life and I found out there was a job in Germany selling encyclopedias to American servicemen that were stationed there in 1968. Um, that was the beginning of it. I was trained to be an American salesman. I then got into the oil business and worked in, in the UK, in Libya, in America, and then finished up in Canada. But key to the whole thing was this essence of anybody can do anything. Anybody has the right to go for it and make the best of whatever life has to offer for them. Opportunity. Fundamentally opportunity. Fundamentally. It was about opportunity. For me, it's unstoppable enthusiasm. It's a country completely without self-doubt, which I think is its great strength, and probably also its great weakness. And speaking as an English person, we do self-doubt better than anybody. But the Americans don't yet. Vietnam tried to give them self-doubt. 9-11 tried to give them self-doubt. But they've resisted it manfully. And it is a country driven by enthusiasm and self-belief. George? I think probably the same as Dad, and, and having watched the, the possibilities and the opportunities that were afforded to people. If more greedy than the market would allow. And if you lend money to people that can't afford to pay it back, it's going to backfire. I think it's more to do with the emotion of undiluted ambition than it is to do with how land is organised. So it's about human emotions. It's yeah. not about the economic mechanism that, that allows uplift in land price. No, I think Americans just like more. I find it tough that, that greed has driven the land market and collapsed the banking system. Do you have a view on this? And specifically from the Thatcher point of view, who has borrowed the idea from Reagan and Reaganomics to say that actually we should speculate in land. Because what we've got now, Larry, um, generation rent is alive and well and, 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 and around us. It's, it certainly is, and, then, and, and, uh, and generation rent are really the ones that are taking the full force of what's, you know, what's been cooked up. Getting back to the American dream, it seems to me what drives the American dream is a belief that if you marry enthusiasm and ambition with hard work, things are gradually going to get better and better for you incrementally. And that's true as long as the economic background behind you is also in a period of gradual growth. But if you hit the buffers and things suddenly start to go wrong, as they did with Lehman's a few years ago, then that ethic of hard work and ambition just unravels. So is the American dream about hard work and rewards, productivity and growth? Well, actually, no. We're seeing that productivity generally is dropping across all the Western economies. And what we're also seeing is that even though about 77% of US businesses offer flexible working and more amenable conditions, about 63% of people, according to a, a survey of 1.4 million employees across the Western world, say being at work is like being a zombie. You worked throughout your 20s and 30s very, very hard. Yep. You were wildly successful in the UK, uh, materially abundant, I'd argue. Yep. And then one day, and I want you to take us through the story, you called your dad because you had that house. <coughs> yep. Pick it up from there. I left school, worked in the music business, did all right at that for a bit. Then I kind of ended up by chance becoming a television presenter. And, uh, and, then, and then it all started to go very well. And I kind of rode the, I rode the back end of the reality TV. But have, you know, I didn't have a boat and a did, plane and all the rest like, of it. Did you put your stuff like, in a, sto a self-storage stuff I, place? Do you know what? I kind of got rid of quite a lot go, of it, actually. And then go and visit your stuff yes. for weekends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I did a little bit of that, actually. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I woke up and I just said, look, you know, I'm, I'm everybody Everybody's telling me I'm killing it. I've got all the material kind of uh, belongings that, that I thought I really wanted. I'm finally on primetime television. I don't feel very happy. And Dad just said to me, well, you know. And I was like, well, you know what? And he said, well, you know, game show host, not a very serious guy in the big scheme of things, is he? 
And I, I was just like, not really. And so eight weeks later, I'd sold my house, I'd got rid of most of my stuff, and I went off to find myself in Asia, in naturally. Way, <laughs> of course you did. In a way, what you've described is a crisis of self-doubt. And it gets back to my point that what drives the American dream is a complete lack of self-doubt. They just absolutely believe in yeah. what they're trying to do. And as yeah. soon as you start questioning that, yeah. you know, the fuel drains away. Yeah. It might have drained away in your point circumstance for a very good reason, with a, in terms of your personal happiness, a very good result. But to an American, that might seem a rather overly Buddhist position. The American dream is really an ambition for more. And actually, you can't have a world where everybody has more. There's not enough more to go around. No, no but you can have a world where everybody's got a much fairer share. That's the point. Like, and when I, I can remember the first time I ever came in touch with the third world, and I was involved in making a film, and we were in Mexico, mm -hmm. and we were in a glorious villa on the edge of the ocean, on the edge of the Pacific, just outside um, Acapulco. Mm -hmm. But when you walked out the door of the glorious villa, there were people living in total squalor across the street with well, pigs running it, it around. It depends what you mean by that. The first time I went to India, I spent, I travelled around, it was a business trip and I was there for about three weeks and the last day I had a guide from the government because I was doing a job for the Indian government and she spent the day with me and she asked me what I'd enjoyed about India and I said I was particularly interested in their fascination with religions. And she asked me about my religion and, and I said I don't really have one, you know, I'd like to but I have no faith. And she, if I said, oh, nice to meet you, I've got terminal cancer, she wouldn't have been more shocked. Yeah. She was absolutely stunned. And in the 24 hours I was with her, she kept asking me this. And when I, she took me to 